Welcome, my friends, one and all, and this is Dave. And today we've got some more woke news from Endymion. We're talking about Assassin's Creed update and what has uh, become of Bioware. Oh, my beloved Bioware, <laughs> what has happened to you? All right, well, let's uh, jump right in it and get to it. Let's do it. Hey everyone, it's Endymion, and today we got two really big topics that we gotta talk about because this is nutty and things are moving fast. I usually don't do three videos in a row, but when there's this much news, well, you know how it is. I gotta hunker down and get to work so more people can know what's happening. Firstly, I wanna speak about Ubisoft and an update to their strikes, more info, and a scoop that I got from my primary source which told me something very interesting about the future of Assassin's Creed. Beyond this, we'll go into another scoop that got revealed in regards to Dragon Age Veilguard that is just awful, man. It's it's so bad. You, you just got to see it. My <laughs> God, dude. Okay, let's dive in. Firstly, Ubisoft. As I reported on before, Ubisoft is currently facing a strike with their employees. Wow, 700 Ubisoft employees strike company. In response to return to office requirements believed to be an attempt to force resignations. Wow, that would be catastrophic for Ubisoft. Is that going on right now? Is that going on right now? Well, let's find out. Things are now looking good. The strike is currently set for three days and we are reaching the end of the strike as of the making of this video. There are plans to extend it, but we will see. In case you don't know, the strike is being pushed because Ubisoft is attempting to force stay-at-home employees to work in offices and essentially remove remote work from their company. And, you know, unfortunately, ever since COVID, like pre-COVID, that rarely happened. Uh, maybe you might be, get, be able to work from home once every so often or whatever. I don't know, but... Generally, pre-COVID, always at the office. Post-COVID, it's kind of normal now for a lot of positions to work at home. I know when I was uh, working uh, in news as a video editor, I was like the only, during COVID, I was the only video editor that needed to be there at the office. All the other editors worked from home. And most of other, the uh, like the, a lot of the shows the anchors and stuff would record from their house. I mean, we all know, we all remember how that was. Uh, but that carried over that, that mentality of being able to work from home has carried over after COVID and, um, and people like it, you know? And so that's, that's, that's a real kind of dick move to eliminate that completely, especially if it's been going on for so long. For anyone in game development, they know how stupid of an idea this is to push on employees considering that many talented game devs, they don't actually work in-house at the studios that they're employed at. Remote work allows studios to get talent that they couldn't normally get because the power of the internet is obviously a thing. And we have so many ways to communicate, email, discord, zoom, carrier pigeons maybe <laughs> i'm sure someone out there still uses them maybe some game devs use the cups with the strings remember well and plus you know if you do contract work uh those devs those designers or whoever you're contracting they're not in the studio so they're technically working off-site i mean they are so really there's really no difference there and like you said we have the technology now to be able to, to do anything, to drop files, to get it to whoever needs to put it into the pipeline at the office. They probably have software that you could put stuff directly into the pipeline, even if you're not in the office. I mean, come on, really? Remember using those as a kid? Remember when you were happy as a kid? Okay, that was a deep cut and I'm called for it. Let's keep on moving <laughs> along. The point here is that this strike is causing a lot of disruptions at Ubisoft. The union representing Ubisoft's employees said this to local news networks. They said, and I quote, The consequence of Ubisoft's decision will be the loss of our colleagues' jobs, the disorganization of many game projects, and the drastic increase in psychosocial risks for those who remain. Wow, psychosocial risk. That's <laughs> that's an awesome term. <laughs> this decision is announced immediately after the failure of the profit-sharing negotiations. 
Exactly like previous salary negotiations, management's proposals were unacceptable. The negotiations timetable was appalling and management was deaf to the proposals of the various employee representatives. First, we want a formal agreement on remote work with a due process of real negotiation between management and unions. Not an arbitrary decision taking several months in advance, one which guarantees that each person can freely choose its number of remote days and when they are in the week, as well as being counted by the month and not by the week. Our reasonable. second demand is an immediate increase in all salaries to compensate for the drop in our living standards in recent years. The yeah. restoration of the profit share... The inflation is killing everybody. Ugh. Killing them. ...sharing at a 60% objective, the end of the gender pay gap and a higher increase in low salaries. The third and final demand is that Ubisoft values employees' opinions by the implementation of a social dialogue worthy of the name. Management seems indeed to confuse monologue with dialogue, end quote. <laughs> so the union is now wow. making demands of Ubisoft, and this strike has been growing and growing, which first started in France, but is now apparently also spilled over into Ubisoft's Italian offices as well. Wow. Alleg and you know, if, if they don't nip this in the bud right now, it's going to continue to spread to all of their uh, branch satellite locations you know because it, i mean it like financially everyone's being hit uh, apparently worldwide but especially if you're in america um it's it is such a huge devastating blow to a lot of people out there that are basically living paycheck to paycheck and um when things like groceries and gas and everything go up 25 percent or more you got to start cutting corners somewhere, you know? Allegedly, Ubisoft workers in Milan, Italy are also now joining the strike. So originally, the number of workers striking was around 700 or so. It mm. could very well be more now as this continues to escalate. Wow. Should remind you that Ubisoft is reeling in financial losses. I mean, they even dropped their financials by around 30% from last year because nothing they're making is doing well at all. This isn't even the first or last controversy that they're dealing with right now. Considering earlier this month, Ubisoft has been caught in yet another lawsuit. This time, they're being sued by users for sharing confidential data of their customers with Meta. Which, wow. in case you don't know, Meta is the owner of things like Facebook. This lawsuit is tied to Ubisoft selling data via their integration with Facebook via Ubisoft Plus, which is their subscription service where you can play their games via a sub over buying them outright. Yeah. Two men, one from California, the other from West Virginia, are suing Ubisoft claiming they were not made aware by the user's agreement that their personal data would be collected and sold to other parties like Meta when using a service like Ubisoft Plus. Why this is a bad thing to get caught in is one, it's illegal to not disclose this, and secondly, because user data is considered more valuable than anything else, because companies can learn what people search for, how often they do so, and what yeah. sites or products they frequent. This then allows merchandise or services to be tailor-made to exploit these demands to make more profit in the future. Hence why user data is so valuable, and 9 times out of 10 when you sign up for something or click accept, your data is being collected to be sold to a third party for it's this true. very reason. So like True. I said, Ubisoft allegedly didn't disclose this and now they're in a lawsuit. So add wow. that to the strike that might delay their 2025 slate even further over, which yes, that also includes Assassin's Creed Shadows. Next up, I want to get into what I was told by one of my sources about Ubisoft and Assassin's Creed in terms of the future of that franchise. This is the same source that told me how much Skull and Bones cost Ubisoft, how Yasuke was inspired by Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. and that Assassin's Creed Hex is a lesbian power fantasy game coming out <laughs> in 2026. Well, I actually got more... A lesbian power fantasy. <laughs> That's just a classic description of that that game <laughs> or info on hex and the assassin's creed brand in general from this source so let me tell you that now so this source told me that ubisoft is dreading the release of hex now because of the information that has been leaked about the game they are calling the reaction to the game's plot and setting to be not what players want from the franchise and in case you don't know hex will be a salem witch trial assassin's creed game that is very fantastical 
with lots of mysticism and a very female centric cast. Lots. You know, I was really looking forward to this game and I still am. I mean, I hope they, I, I really hope they make it. And I don't care if there's a bunch of women in it because it's about the witches and like, you know, all that stuff. So that would be, that would make sense that there are a lot of women in this, in this game. Maybe if you had like a warlock or something, I don't know. But I mean, I have no problem. But just as long as they write the characters okay and the story is okay and nothing is mentioned about the, the them being lesbian or in, or in like lesbian relationships because we don't, that has nothing to do with anything. We We don't need that information and it shouldn't even be surfacing anywhere in, in, in the game because it's not important and nobody cares. Lots of lesbian characters. Villains are mostly just men. It's a very big departure from the series. And that's another problem. If, if the women, whatever, I mean, obviously they're going to be witches in this one. If they're portrayed as the good guys and all men are portrayed as bad guys, that's a serious problem because there's, I, I would say, a majority of gamers are men. So alienating your uh, your main market, you know, demographic is not not good. As it goes full blown fantasy in ways, if you will. Anyway, I'm told that Ubisoft is contemplating reducing resources for this hex game because they were originally considering it to be the next mainline title in the Assassin's Creed franchise after Shadows. There's already four years of dev time in this game already, wow. with another two at least left before it's finished, hence why I said it will likely come out in 26. They are internally, allegedly, very angry that people are not enjoying the female-centric push for this game and others, and that there is discussions that the game might get gutted in order to change it to make it more commercially viable, if you will, but I doubt anything they can do to this game will fix much of anything. Well, I mean, first of all, they could just rewrite the, the storyline so that all the, the men are douchebags, you know, like patriarchal maniacs and make it so that the women aren't power, you know, girl power, everything. I mean, they're going to be powerful because they're going to be witches, right? <laughs> so they're going to be able to wield all that magic or whatever. But yeah, <laughs> There's probably not a whole lot they would actually need to to change up to make to to salvage that game. So I don't exactly agree with what uh, Endymion says on that. Ubisoft is also allegedly angry about the multiplayer game feedback that they're getting as well. It's clear that they are disillusioned that everything they're doing when it comes to Assassin's Creed is not working and they are not happy at all. I was also told what my source told me was an approved and strategic leak on Ubisoft's part given to see if players were receptive to what was to come in the future. So in a way, I kind of played into Ubisoft's hand apparently and whistled their future releases on their behalf without even really knowing it. But that's okay, because clearly what I was told and said didn't jive well with fans at all. And hey Ubisoft, if you're watching, just reach out to me and I can tell people what you're doing and whether people will like it or not. Yeah. If you want to fix your company and image and make what people want, maybe it's time to have a conversation with actual fans of your games. I've played almost yeah. every Assassin's Creed title, so I'm coming from a fan's perspective, and yeah, I can tell you that Hex sounds like something I would not buy at release at all. Lastly, apparently Ubisoft is angry that the only thing fans reacted well in a positive light were the leaks about the remakes of the original Assassin's Creed game and Ezio's trilogy. Yeah, now that would be totally awesome. I don't know, I, you know, I, I teach their own for what they think would be a cool game. I still think that magic based universe or not even the universe, but for, for that world of uh, Assassin's Creed, I think it'd be totally, totally cool. <sighs> Man, I really wish they don't cancel it, but I would, but I hope that they just fix it. They save it, you know, cause it needs saving. I think it'd be an awesome game. So again, I'm not in agreement, hundred percent on what Endymion is saying here about, about the hex. It's gonna, I think it would be totally cool. But I mean, that's obvious. Of course fans would want that to happen because the original Assassin's Creed and Ezio's games were awesome. Even oh, yeah. I want those games remade too, as oh, long gosh, as they yes. don't, you know, modern audience them. I they would make so much money, yeah, if they didn't modern audience them. <laughs> that's the key. But if they just basically redid it and just updated the graphics so it looks awesome, 
a lot like they did with uh not, not them but how uh how it was done with uh silent hill 2 i'm playing that right now on the channel and uh yeah they basically took the the game made it look modern so it looks great uh, and then they, you know, they tweaked, uh, they added a little bit here, changed the dialogue to, you know, make things flow a little bit better, you know. But it's essentially the exact same game. It just looks modern now. And that's what they need to do to those Assassin, those, the first two Assassin's Creed games, because it would be, I mean, people would be throwing them bags of money. I also have a hell of an idea for an Assassin's Creed game if Ubisoft is willing to listen to me, but I won't share it here. But if you want to hear my idea for a That's game smart. that could set you on the right track, my email is in the description, Ubisoft. Just reach out. I promise you, once I tell you what this game idea is, you're going to love it. But this is what I've been told about Ubisoft right now. Their employees are striking. Said strike has now spread to Italy. They are in a lawsuit for selling data without telling customers. Wow. And hacks may get gutted based on reception, and they are scrambling behind the scenes. I've told you guys plenty before on Ubisoft that has turned out to be true. I trust this source, so... Please spread the word about this and thank you. Yeah. Okay, now let's get into the second part of this video, which is oh Dragon Age Veilguard, and this is oh boy. <laughs> not looking good at all. But it was so interesting that I had to share it with you guys, so here we are. I'm a big Dragon Age fan. I played the previous three games religiously. It's I 100%ed Origins on Xbox 360, and I even platinumed Inquisition as well. Yeah. I know this universe... Man, he platinums a lot of games. Holy cow. I'm not a complete uh, completionist, so... It doesn't bother me. <laughs> I don't get all the uh, trophies and all that kind of stuff, you know. So, but that's just me. Everyone's different. So, uh, and that's what makes the world a good place. First, <laughs> inside is out, as well as its characters. And based on what has been unearthed here, Veilguard may actually end up being the wokest game this year. And no, I'm not kidding. Wow. So this story comes from a content creator named Noor. I hope I'm saying that right. This is their Twitter here, N-U-H-R-E. I'm gonna call them Noor if that's cool, but if I'm wrong, please correct me in the comments. Anyways, Noor spoke to someone who allegedly playtested Veilguard and beat the entire game already and was employed by oh, wow. Bioware to give them honest feedback on the game as a whole. To strengthen this person's claims, Noor spoke to this person live on Twitch and they didn't even filter their voice. So clearly this play tester does not care at all about being found out, which I mean, if they signed an NDA, then they could get sued, but let's keep moving on. They screen shared their screen with Newer and showed them information that allegedly confirms that they did indeed work at Bioware. Even showing the play testing information as well as parking lot information and which specific gate at EA or Bioware that they were told to use in order to get to the studio in order to play test Veilguard. This okay. play tester played the game from October last year and beat the entire game already, allegedly. And yeah, confirmed in the video that this person did sign an NDA. Again, the guy's voice is in the video. So I mean, yeah, they will probably get found out and sued. But OK, anyway, let's get into what was mm. leaked here because it's a lot. Firstly, the play tester claimed that the game is full on modern audience woke language all over the place. And a lot of the modern 2024 real world nonsense is present in this game, which is very much not the real world at all and shouldn't be in here in the first place. For example, Tosh, the Kunari companion in the game, you know, the one who's ugly as sin, apparently <laughs> tells Rook, the main character in their first encounter, that Tosh is non-binary. Like they just straight up say that and throw it in your face immediately. Why? Why? Who cares? Nobody cares. My gosh, how is how difficult is this to understand? Nobody cares who you sleep with when you <laughs> as a character when you play a game. It should never come up unless it's somehow woven into the actual storyline for some reason. But even that, it it shouldn't. It shouldn't come up ever. This is already awful and fills me with despair, but it keeps going. Next is that besides the pronouns nonsense being thrust down your throat, the game's romances are allegedly locked based on your choices in the character selection screen. Apparently in the build of this game which the tester played, if you chose the pronouns he, him and you know confirm that you're straight, then you're immediately locked into only two romance options for your character, which is Nev or Neve, the Ice Mage brown lady person, and Harding, the dwarf girl from Inquisition. However, if you confirm that your character is pansexual in the character creator, then you are actually able to romance anyone in the game regardless of your gender or pronouns. 
Apparently, this feature may have been changed due to Baldur's Gate 3's success, which allowed you to romance anyone no matter what you were, but the jury is still out on this one. But the fact that you can only have two romance options if you were a straight man is ridiculous to me, which means you can't romance the Asian elf chick. I believe her name is Balara if you're a straight man, but maybe you can if you're gay or they're only into women. But if you're pansexual and a man, then Balara is magically suddenly available to you. Notice how all of this is convoluted nonsense and is just more current deisms in modern gaming. I hate yeah. it here, man, but there's more. Solus, who was a major character and plot device in Inquisition, which I don't want to spoil in case you didn't play Inquisition, is apparently sidelined for about 90% of the game. He allegedly really? shows up mostly at the beginning of the game, which we know since he is clearly in the footage Bioware released a few yeah. months ago, and then he apparently shows up near the end of the game and that's it. Also, the ending of the game is considered Why? awful and makes everything worse going forward. As a major Dragon Age fan, I can only speak for myself, but I always found Solus's story to be the main driving force of this game in terms of what I actually wanted to see, because his story, characterization, and lore within Inquisition is pivotal to what should theoretically happen next. Yeah. So to hear that he allegedly gets sidelined in a game that was originally called Dreadwolf, for God's sakes, which is literally a reference to Solus, is kind of baffling to me. If this is true, this is genuinely so upsetting and awful, but we'll see. The playtester also claims that the story in general is disappointing and keeps disappointing you as a core Dragon Age fan from story beat to story beat. Again, it's a bold claim, but he gives no examples here, but let's keep going. Your character that you play as, whose name is Rook, apparently has basically no backstory whatsoever besides what happens in the beginning. Beyond your origin you choose, you are mostly just some badass that is first met in a bar, and that's it. There's no revelation <laughs> about your character or anything like that. You're just some capable person who happens to step into a leadership role, and there's no twist for your character at all in terms of your hmm. origin or your story or anything else. Wow. So Rook is... So there's no character growth as a player, as the play player's character? That, that kind of stinks. It's just Rook, a blank slate meant to be a vehicle for the character, which is not very exciting, but all right then. This playtester allegedly had reports after reports trying to warn Bioware that the game was far too woke and socially pandering. But the manager of these playtesters, who was the conduit between the testers and Bioware, told this playtester that while their report was solid and had plenty of rightful criticisms, that they could not pass these criticisms along because they were told by Bioware that rejection of woke identity politics and LGBTQ plus agendas were forbidden and would be ignored by the development team. Wow. So this point specifically irked me a lot because refusing to allow... Then why even have playtesting? Honestly. Because if it's going to be a major theme of the game and you're not allowed to criticize any part of that game, then your game is going to suck the discussion of wokeness in gaming is a big reason why the western side of the gaming sphere is falling apart so rapidly. They openly refuse to speak about the implications and rejections of these ideologies within their products ever, instead resorting to blocking all feedback because it goes against their agenda. It firmly means It's like these these developers or the management, it's like they're, it's like they're little children, you know? And they're just having temper tantrums. They don't want to hear it because they just want it their way. It's so, it's so, so asinine. It's so crazy. Means that, yes, if this is true, as this playtester claims, that the agenda pushing is absolutely paramount over the core gameplay experience that you can have as a fan of the game. They don't want you to be able to escape this agenda no matter what, and including things like a goddamn Kunari of all races, telling you that they're non-binary is so ridiculous because the Kunari <laughs> are a tribal people who value strength and honor above all other things. Right. In case you don't know, Kunari live by a text known as the Kun. It's a religious book that dictates how the Kunari may live and operate within the world. And technically speaking, anyone who embraces the Kun can be considered as a Kunari themselves. Although the actual blood-related Kunari are a race that originate their existence allegedly from dragons to some capacity. Hence why they have the big horns and are much larger than the other races in the game. And if a Kunari rejects the Kun and lives their own life outside of the Legion, they are branded a heretic and then they're called Talvishoth, if I remember right. correctly. Even the humans, elves, and dwarves that embrace the Kun, which they are usually then called Vidathari by the Kunari, can also hmm. become Talvishoth. 
if they also end up rejecting the kun in the future. And if a kunari runs into one of these heretics by religious law, they are bound to try to kill you if they so please. So, so they're cutting against the grain of the actual ideologies of of the game of the game world, right? I mean, so if so, nobody would ever say that they were non-binary because that wouldn't even be they wouldn't speak it because as soon as they did they would become a heretic and then they their life would basically be over with <sighs> these people i don't i don't understand so the kun is like an organized religion anyways a kunari claiming that they are non-binary is ridiculous because yeah. the kunari plays far more importance in your role within the kunari than you as an individual the concept of a kunari referring to themselves as non-binary or whatever else is utterly ridiculous. Yeah, the kunari are governed by three core groups that represent the body, mind, and soul of their society. And each part of the kunari are then led by a powerful kunari. For example, the body is the military power of the kunari and is governed and led by the Arashok. You may remember one of the core villains of Dragon Age 2 to be mm. literally called the Arashok. Yeah, same person. Yeah. Look at that. Now that looks awesome. That looks way cool. I don't know what the deal is, why they made everything so soft and everything in their forehead now for this new game. Because that looks way more realistic what you'd think if someone had big gigantic horns growing out of their forehead. You know? That looks cool. And same deal. The Kunari also do not value individuality as I referenced before. Instead, they refer to each other based on titles instead of pronouns. So you may be called worker, blacksmith, warrior, or farmer right. instead of she or he within Kunari culture. Right. Nicknames are used for individual Kunari, but largely speaking, the concept of pronouns within their society, it's not really a thing. Which means, if this is true that Tosh is non-binary and tells you to refer to her as that, then they are either Tel Vashoth of the highest caliber or the people at Bioware don't understand their own lore. So pick right. your own poison, they, I guess. Like I said, I know quite a bit about the Dragon Age heretic. world, which is why this game is so perplexing to me. Like I want it to be good. I do want to play it. If anything, to see if these claims are true or not so I can properly review it from yeah. the perspective of someone who knows this world intimately. And I also think it would be fun to have me as a very based individual to find comb this <laughs> supposed woke disaster with my experience of this world and the lore and just see how badly Bioware screwed it up. Another claim is that Davrim, another companion who's a black man who is also a Grey Warden, is apparently allowed to make executive decisions within the Grey Warden storyline in this game, even though they never actually finished their training or reached a rank within the Grey Wardens. According to the playtester, Davrim is simply allowed to speak and make decisions because he wow. is a black man. This again makes me confused because the Grey Wardens are a very strict legion of warriors. Yeah. In case you don't know, the Grey Wardens are the elite force that was formed to stop Blights, which are these hordes of Darkspawn that create false gods and then use the soul of these other interdimensional older gods to create what is called an Archdemon. An Archdemon is usually a blasphemous imitation of a dragon. The main thread in Origins is exactly this. The dragon on the cover is the archdemon of that game's story. The mm. Darkspawn, if you don't know, were created because the Tevinter Magisters used their magic to open a portal to the Maker's home. And the Maker is basically God, if you will, and they wanted to reach the Golden City where he resides and lives. So when the Magisters entered the Golden City, they found an empty throne, and then the Maker instead banished the Magisters and then cursed them for opening a pathway to his location. These Magisters would then be corrupted for their greed of power and lust for knowledge and would become monsters known as the First Darkspawn. Corypheus, the main villain of Inquisition, he was one of these original Darkspawn by the way. So when the Darkspawn emerged from the Deep Roads, which are these massive pathways beneath Thetis, which is the name of Dragon Age's world, fun fact, Thetis is an acronym for the Dragon Age setting. The more you know, I guess, <laughs> these Darkspawn usually worship an old god and then by amassing flesh and whatever, and then they create an archdemon for their old god to possess, thus creating a new blight. Then mm. human, dwarves, elves, and so on who do battle with these darkspawn, they mostly die upon fighting them, because darkspawn's blood is corrupted and it usually kills them very quickly if they consume it. However, mm. some individuals whose bodies can withstand the corruption of the darkspawn by consuming their blood willingly, they end up becoming what is called a Grey Warden. 
a Grey Warden is then able to commune with the Archdemon the same way the Darkspawn can, and effectively, they could use their connection to the Archdemon as a sort of medieval GPS, if you will, and then follow the Archdemon's whispers to its location to finally slay it and then rid the world of that blight. Hmm. Once this is done, the Grey Wardens have a much shorter lifespan than normal people, and the corruption eventually kills them, or it turns them into Darkspawn themselves. But it's seen as a duty and sacrifice on the Wardens' behalf to forego their future to save Thetis and their people. So the Grey Wardens would never listen to a recruit who has not even finished their training. So yeah. if this is true, it's also just as ridiculous, if not even more ridiculous, than the Kunari claiming that they're non-binary. Grey Warden recruits are looked at as nothing but grunts, and if you don't even finish your training, you're seen as even less than that. So if yeah. Davram were to speak up as a not even Grey Warden to anyone that's in command there, he should only be laughed at and spit on, but this is modern Bioware, and this means because he's a person of color, I guess, he's somehow important because of just that. I'm tired. Yeah, I mean, that'd be the same thing as like somebody uh, joining a company as an intern and then like walking into a board meeting or something and like legitimately trying to like lay down ideas <laughs> for the company. People would be like, who in the freak are you? Get the heck out of here, right? And even if they were like really good ideas, it would be valid. It would be valid because the, 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 the dude's an intern, the person, whoever it is, man or woman. That's just ridiculous. That is ridiculous. And I really love the deep dive that uh, Endymion is doing for Dragon Age because a lot of the stuff I've, I've forgotten a lot of it. So that's pretty cool. Hired man, but if this is true again, it's beyond stupid. The playtester also said the game feels like a walking simulator with plenty of fetch quests and open areas that offer nothing interesting to do besides a walking simulator that has got to be one of the worst descriptions of a game. <laughs> if you're trying to make a fun, cool game like Dragon Age has been in the past, <laughs> a walking simulator, like picking up items and uh, killing enemies, which man. is probably the least egregious thing said so far, to be fair. I'm yeah. not saying that's great, but I can stomach some fetch quests and just mindlessly killing of monsters far more than I can fathom insubordination in the Grey Wardens or Woe Kunari myself. Varric is also apparently pushed to an advisory role and is sidelined as well, which sucks because Varric is one of the best characters in these games. There's a reason why he's playable in both Dragon Age 2 and Inquisition, because he's objectively great as a character. Yeah. So sidelining him seems stupid to me. Again, it seems like to me that he's being used as a member berries more than anything else. I mean, Bioware even shows that Varric is present from the literal moment the game starts in the bar, and he accompanies you the entire first mission and then some. At least until you get to Solus. So sidelining him is just stupid. He should have been a party member. Considering Varric has a big connection to not only Solus, but also the Inquisitor from Inquisition, as well as Hawk from Dragon Age 2. I can just feel my blood boiling, fellas. All my knowledge of Dragon Age is just <laughs> erupting out of me like the goddamn Phoenix Force right now, and it's not looking good. The playtester concludes that the game is so far removed from what made Origins popular that it might as well as not even be set in the same universe. Yeah. And the playtester ended the interview stating that this game will be the end of Bioware according to them. Other interesting tidbits is that the Inquisitor, your main character in Inquisition, does show up in this game. But they are corrupted, apparently. And whether you disbanded the Inquisition or not at the end of the Trespasser DLC, it apparently has no bearing on this game's story whatsoever, which is also kind of ridiculous. Considering the Inquisition is a law placed that if the world is ever to be threatened by something that could end it, that a group of individuals from every walk of life and religion could band together and place their differences aside in order to assemble to end the world-ending threat against Thetis. Exactly. So the fact that Solus is trying to merge the physical world of Thetis with the spiritual world of the Fade, and then you're telling me that our Inquisitor is pointless in the story? That is so ridiculous if it's true. Also, the Fade is where magic originates from within Dragon Age's world. So, so where all the demons originate from, as well as things like pride demons that prey on humans, they can also corrupt magically sensitive individuals more easily too, since mages obviously have a direct connection to the Fade. This is why dwarves aren't as affected by the Fade, because they cannot dream. Thus, their connection to that realm is severed, making them actually ideal candidates to fight demons. 
Hmm. But making the Inquisitor pointless here and then making our decisions not matter, it's so sad, man. Just, ugh, why? Also, apparently the facial animations are Mass Effect Andromeda all over again, which I truly hope not. Because mm. if there was one thing Bioware had to nail here, it was the facial animations. Yeah. They do seem decent enough in the pre-release footage that I've seen so far. So hopefully, if anything, this got fixed compared to the version that this playtester played themselves. Yeah. And it looks like I misspoke. The walking simulator section is actually tied to the gameplay sections of the Fade, not Thetis. This is also disappointing anyway, considering that the Fade has been used plenty in previous games when it comes to interesting level designs. So turning what is arguably your most valuable location for cool gameplay level layouts into what is being called a walking simulator, well, it doesn't fill me with joy, fellas. There is more info here too, so the romance options were gender locked before but they were likely now changed since then with the whole pansexual stuff. Another info bid released by this playtester is that the primary antagonists of the game are actually not Solus at all but two others. So the first one is Gilanane, who is an elven goddess within the lore of Dragon Age and she's apparently trying to create new darkspawn or a blight. I assume this character in the dragon gameplay they revealed here could be Gilanane or an agent of them, so this tracks. And then the other main villain is Elgernon, who's pretty much the father of the elves and the first elven god. He's apparently trying to enslave the elves of Thetis in this game. So I would wager that Solus opens the portal at the beginning of the game, and then Gilanane, the mother, and Elgernon, the father of elves, escapes from the Fade, which tracks since they were sealed in the Fade all the way back when Tevinter basically enslaved the elves and took over Arlathing, which was like the hmm. empire of the elves, if you will. And the elves existed in Thetis proper before everyone else did until the first men came and so on. And if I remember correctly, the reason why the Magisters were able to defeat the Elves was because the Old Gods were communing with mankind and pretty much gave them access to magic in order to destroy the Elves and enslave them. And of course, this same corruption of power led to, like I said earlier, mankind into Vinter, which is where Vilgard takes place, by the way, and is the home of magic within the Imperium, leading to the whole Maker thing and Darkspawn getting born in the first place. So those two being mm. the villains, I guess, makes sense since, yeah, they would definitely be pissed and want to enact revenge on mankind for completely ruining their plans and their people. The leaker also says that the ending is just Mass Effect 3 all over again in terms of choices. And in terms of Solus, you can either just save him or end him and that's it, which is ugh, okay, I guess. So they hyped up a whole game about Solus and then they sideline him because why exactly? He's a man? Yeah. I don't get it at all. Yeah. Everything I'm hearing here is that this game is just going to be very divisive and that's putting it lightly. Who knows, maybe these problems have been addressed since last year, but the likelihood of it happening is very slim if not at all. I just can't fathom why after 10 years since the last Dragon Age that Bioware decided to go all in on this. I know it's not surprising, but damn if it is disappointing. I should also mention that the director of Veilguard was also the director of the Sims game that implemented Trans Surgery Scars originally too. So I guess oh gosh, I shouldn't yeah, I be surprised that. that it's here as well. <laughs> but seeing the agenda, the stink, sweet, baby-esque garbage lathered all over Dragon Age like this, it's terrible to witness. I love this series. I want nothing more than a return to form for it. I still do think that reviewers will love this game, and they will likely score it high if not for any other reason than the agenda that it's pushing. So I'm very interested to see what the general gaming audience thinks, and when this comes out at the end of October this year, will people buy it or not? Will you be playing this game? Let me know in the comments. As for Assassin's Creed, do you think the news about Hex being axed or gutted is a good thing or bad? As always, thank you for watching, subscribe, thanks to my supporters, have a great day. This video is way too long already, and I'll <laughs> see you in the next one. All right, well, that was a uh, very interesting, uh, that super deep dive <laughs> of the backstory of Dragon Age. Wow, there's so much of that stuff I've totally forgotten. Uh, I played the... Uh, I think I've played actually all three of them, but it's been a while. It's been a long while. So, but I've, I, but I know that I've, I, I, I've enjoyed playing, uh, especially the first two. Um, Inquisition was okay. I, I remember, but it was pretty good. But anyways, uh, yeah. So if, uh, if you like the reaction, uh, consider subscribing and, uh, liking, uh, and commenting and hitting that bell, doing all that jazz. It really makes a difference to the channel and helps me grow and uh, be able to provide more content for uh, people to watch. Okay, well, again, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Have a great day, and we'll catch you in the next video. See ya.
I got nightmares in my head, I fear Let the thoughts build up until I can't hear